in this video we're going to be looking at dry deciduous woodland that's within the broad scale habitat broadleaf woodland. Dry deciduous woodland includes natural or semi-natural woodlands with canopies made up of one or more of the following native broadleaf deciduous trees. Birch, beech, ash, aspen, pedunculate or sessile oak, rowan, large or small leaf lime and witch elm. This can also include newly planted woods, for example farm woodlands, but excludes those of ornamental woods, for example planted within the grounds of a country house, and it also excludes commercial plantations of native species. I'm now going to show you some of the species listed for dry deciduous woodland. Remember, if you are recording at wildflower level, you only need to record the ones with a black flower symbol. So here we've come across sweet woodruff, also known as Galium odoratum. Um, it's actually the same family as the cleavers, uh, goose, goose grass, sticky grass, as you might know it. Um, it is often found in woodlands like this, and you can get little spikes of it coming up like this, or you can have big patches where all you can see is sweet woodruff. And as you can see, it's got its leaves in whorls around the main stem. That means they form a sort of circle around rather than a leaflet coming off at each side. The flowers are white and they almost form a little umbel at the top here. Apparently, they, um, it's called sweet woodruff because it, it smells nicely of hay when, uh, of sweet hay when dried. Um, it's also pretty much hairless, whereas cleavers, if you were to touch it, it would feel rough and, and stick to your clothes. This is very different indeed. So here's another one. Dog's Mercury. It's a fairly innocuous plant really. I mean it's basically all green, green leaves, green tiny 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 flowers. So as you can see if I zoom out it's actually quite difficult to see it. But you can get it in really really dense coverings on the woodland floor and some woodland types are actually dominated by this on the ground flora. But as you can see it has opposite pairs of leaves that alternate up the stem. So we've got them going this way and then this way. And the leaves have stalks as well, it's quite worth remembering. And the flowers, as I said, are absolutely teeny teeny tiny. They're just these little bundles on these stalks at the very tip of the plant. And this is dog's mercury. So here we are with another one of our indicator species. This is yellow archangel. Now, there's often a garden variety called garden archangel that many people plant in their gardens that unfortunately has made its way into our woodlands and often hybridizes with our native one, just like with the Spanish bluebells. This one, however, is one of our native ones. As you can see, it's rather beautiful and it's very much part of the nettle family with these nettle type leaves and these very hooded flowers. They're very yellow, but at a sort of warm, buttery yellow. The flower, the whole plant in general, is rather sort of densely hairy, but not stinging at all like the nettle, rest of some of the nettle family. Here I've come across a patch of violets. Now, whether you're recording at wildflower or indicator level, we simply ask that if it's common dog violet or early dog violet, it doesn't matter. You record it as just one of the dog violets. Now, as you can see, this is common dog violet, which has a very pale spur at the back and what really can only be described as a notch spur or a little bottom on the end. Um, but this one is common dog violet. Here, as I'm walking along the path, you can see there's some little clumps of some woodland grasses here. As we come a bit closer to it, you'll see that it's relatively pale green and quite soft looking in appearance, although not really, really hairy. And this is also a patch of wood melic. As you can see, this one's not quite in flower yet. The little flower heads are just starting to pop out here. Here's the wood melic properly in flower here. It's actually one of my favourite grasses. This and quaking grass probably up there as my top two. It's so delicate, 
partly because of the contrast between the size of these spikelets to the incredibly thin stalks that they're on. Almost makes it look like, look like they're hanging in the air. Here's an example of where wood melic, instead of looking a bit tufty like it did before, has formed an entire carpet of grasses here amongst the bluebells in this opening bit. Because when we go down and we look at the grass, you can see it's got those characteristic large pod type flowers on the inflorescence here. Here we have another one of our woodland grasses that you need to be able to spot if you're surveying at indicator level. So this one's called wood millet. I mean the word millet is fairly obvious because it does actually look more like a crop. Firstly against my hand here you can just see how wide and broad these leaf blades are. Again, similar to the wood melic, it's a fairly pale green with a soft appearance, not highly shiny. On this one, it's only just starting to flower. If we look at the one beyond, you can see as it's flowering, this inflorescence, which is what we call the flowers of grasses, is really starting to open out as it comes down. And this grass, when complete, will be a good metre or so tall. Here we've got wood speedwell. Now if you remember from Ben's webinar he talks about how it's very similar to Jamanda speedwell. But if we look really carefully here you can see that the hairs on all of the stalks are very much evenly distributed all the way around rather than all collecting on one side of the stem as if it's got Mohicans on either side. You can also see that although the flower's not completely out, it's quite a pale mauvey blue rather than very blue. And also the leaves have quite long stalks here, as well as the, the stalks for the flowers as well. So as you can see, I've just zoomed in here using my special piece of equipment. And as you can see, the hairs are very much evenly distributed along. Rather fortuitously, I have actually come across the Germanda speedwell in the same place. So as you can see, it is a slightly bluier blue, but that's very hard to see on a video. Very similar otherwise in structure. But can you see how short the leaf stalks are compared with the wood speedwell? And also, I'll now zoom up. I mean, to be honest, I don't need to zoom up. You can see how the hairs are split like that across the two sides of the stem as if it's got a Mohican on either side, but I'll zoom in just so you can see as well. So as you can see on the Jamanda speedwell, the hairs are all very much on either side of the stem as you go up, compared with equally all the way around. Here I've just come across a patch of another one of our indicators. This is wood sedge which as you can see it forms a tuft of vegetation and if we go in a little bit closer you can see that again the leaves are fairly bright yellowy green and they've got very obvious and distinct ridges along the leaves which you can see on both sides and they feel quite sharp on the edge but not too sharp not like it's going to do you any damage um, I and mean, if you actually manage to find a stalk where one of the flowers are coming out it has the characteristic three sort of cornered triangular stem cross section that gives you the edges. So a good way of remembering it is sedges have edges. And this is the flower of the sedge. So you can see they kind of droop down in nodding heads with the separate male bits at the top and then the female bits nodding down here. So here we have another one. This is wood spurge. It's a type of euphorbia, which many of us may be used to putting in our gardens, but this is one of our native ones. As you can see, it has the classic strange euphorbia species flowers that don't really look like flowers at all. They're just really adapted sepals and tepals, really. This one has the classic whorls of long strap-like plant leaves, a bit like a sort of miniature rhododendron and it has very reddish stems. And this is our native woodland species. Another one of the woodland species to look out for is something called common twyblade. It's 
kind of part of the orchid family. And you can hear, see at the moment it's now the end of April. It's not properly in flower yet, so perhaps if you're doing your first survey around now, this is what you're, all you'll see. These two very large, very sort of almost succulent in their texture, not hairy at all, with this very characteristic little spike down here, which will eventually spread out to be the beautiful common twi-blade flowers, which look like little men hanging off. But you can see here is another one, again, with these two leaves almost cupping each other, and you poke down and there you can see the twi-blade flower. I found another twi-blade, but this time, this one's just gotten that tiny bit further along, as you can see. Now what at first glance might look like another one of the twi blades coming up because it's got these big fleshy plain leaves coming up. As you can see it hasn't got that that interesting little knobbly flower coming up through the middle. You can see this one's covered with more leaflets rather than just the single stalk and I'm rather lucky that this is actually greater butterfly orchid coming up here and I know that because I've seen it here many times as well. Here we have a plant that most of you will probably be very familiar with or at least you'll recognise how distinctive it is and partly because if you just gently rub one of the leaves and smell your fingers it's going to smell of garlic because this is wild garlic. And as you can see it's got these beautiful allium type flower heads um, and these very broad um, fleshy easily crushed leaves. Sanicle is a hairless plant with shiny lobed leaves. Flowers are in clumps or tight umbels and are pinkish white and the stems are often pinkish tinged also. Here we have wood avens or herb bennet. Again another densely hairy plant. Um, most people would know it as perhaps one of the geums that they've planted in their garden because it's very similar to that in its structure um, and it has this sort of almost trifoliate or three-leaved leaflets appearance. Here I've managed to find um, a wood avon that's actually in flower. As you can see, it's really rather pretty. Very yellow with the five petals and the very, very obvious triangular pointed sepals that you can see poking out that are longer than all the petals here. And they're on relatively long flower stalks as well. Here we have red campion. It's actually pink really rather than red. The leaves, like many of our other plants that we've looked at, come in opposite pairs that alternate up the stem. They're quite hairy um, on both sides um, and as you can see there's not really um, a stalk to the leaf at all, it kind of clasps almost from the stem which is rounded and also hairy. Um, and the bottom leaves are much larger lobed and also pretty hairy as well. There are some other species that I haven't covered with video footage therefore I'm just going to briefly go over some of the key characteristics for the rest of those species that are indicators for dry deciduous woodland. Giant bellflower, Campanula latifolia, has bluntly angled stems um, and its lower leaves tend to taper gently into stalks. Um, it can be an established alien on waste ground, but if it is found growing naturally, then it tends to be in more fertile or rich or calcareous woodland soils. Um, its status um, is slightly more to the northern side of it, if you can see with this distribution map, um, than the nettle leaf bellflower, which is what we'll talk about next. Nettle leaved bellflower, or Campanula trachyleum, has a sharply angled stem and its lower leaves abruptly narrow to stalks. Um, it's sharp, more sort of sharply coarsely toothed leaves than the giant bellflower and the flowers are generally smaller than the giant bellflower as well. The flower head is more loose and drooping um, but again it can be found on a similar woodland soil type with its distribution being more central to southern areas of the UK. Climbing Cordalis is a pale and delicate annual climber. It has pale cream flowers and it has pinkish stems and has tendrils. Generally found on the more acid soils, maybe peaty soils. 
It is distributed across the whole of the UK, but is known to be a local species, meaning that you're not one to, to likely find that often. Hound's tongue. This is a fairly distinctive plant. It's a sort of greyish green in colour all over on its leaves and its stems, and its flowers seem to range from red to purple in colour almost across the actual whole plant itself. The nutlets or the seeds are spiny with hooked hairs. It's often more associated with grassland habitats, but it can be found in woodlands also. Spurge laurel is an evergreen, low-growing shrub, usually found on more calcareous soils. It is generally more southerly distributed in the UK, and it can look like a small version of cherry laurel. The flowers are yellow-green and tubular, and these are then followed by berries that ripen to black. Three-nerved sandwort. It's a low-growing plant and can easily be confused with chickweed because it looks very similar. However, it has three distinct veins, sometimes five, that if held up to the light run evenly down the leaf without branching or having just the one central vein like chickweed does. It's frequent plant in woods um, and well distributed across the UK. Once you get your eye in on this little plant, you'll easily recognise it next time. Wood sage. This plant, which does look reminiscent of sage, as it is a member of the mint family, it tends to prefer the more acidic soils, but can be found on mildly calcareous. And it does seem to appear in many different habitat types, so not just woodlands. It has very wrinkly leaves and small yellow-green flowers in a spike similar to that of a foxglove.